a tremendous blessing to have him. The week before that, we started a new series on the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit, for those of you that um, may not know what that is, is found out of a passage in Galatians chapter 5. But we started talking about this idea that our lives have to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Um, that you are the captain of your life, you are in control of your life, and you're in control of the decisions that you make, and what you do, what you do not do. And the Bible t- calls this, for believers, yielding to the Spirit. Or, if you n- are not yielding to the Spirit, the Bible says that you're yielding to something else, you're yielding to the flesh or your fleshly nature. This is crucial to understand uh, as a believer, as a person that's walking this planet, so many people do not understand this, and so they don't understand the problems that they have. They don't understand the turmoil that goes on in the inside of them. They don't understand the different desires, the different passions. How can I desire to live for God, but yet also desire to do wrong? How can I desire to do right and follow God, but yet I find it very difficult to do it? Those, those things that battle on the inside of all of us. So many people don't understand that, but it's all found right here in this passage in Galatians chapter 5. So we're going to read this passage again, Galatians 5, 16. It says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you're led, or if you yield, you could say, if you choose to yield to the Spirit, if you're led by the Spirit, then you're not under the law. Another way of saying that is you're not under the curse that comes on your life from following the law, or for not following the law. So he says, choose to be led by the Spirit. Now, we're going to read several passages this morning, and you're going to notice the Bible's very clear that you are in complete control as to whether you are led by the Spirit or whether you're led by the flesh, whether you yield to the Spirit or whether you yield to the flesh. That's completely within your control. Even though a lot of people like to think that they're not, and they say, well, I can't help that I feel that way. I can't help that I did that. It's just, it's so much in me. I, it overcame me. I couldn't help that I did it. The Bible says that you can help it. And if you, be, if you believe differently than that, then you've bought into a lie and you've been deceived on that topic. No, you can do it. And I'm going to show you that from the Word of God. How many of you know that a life that is yielded to the Spirit looks way different than a life that's yielded to the flesh? Somebody that walks day in and day out purposing to live and yield to the Spirit, it looks way different than a person that just yields to the flesh constantly and has no concept of what we're talking about. How many of you would rather be married to somebody that knows how to yield to the Spirit? Man, praise God. I, me too. Look, when you're, getting, when you're looking about choosing a spouse, you're thinking about that, this ought to be top one, like one of the top ones on your list. Does this person know how to yield to the Spirit of God? Do they know how to yield? Because as we get into this series, what you're really going to see is that a life that's yielded to the Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit. You know what the fruit of the Spirit is? Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, meekness, and on and on. So a person who knows how to yield to the Spirit, those fruits in their life are going to be produced. It's much better to be married to a person that's yielded to the Spirit than yielding to the flesh. Anger, bitterness, resentment. Right? How many of you'd rather have kids that know how to yield to the Spirit? I mean, you can't trade them in or anything like that if they're not doing that, but it's your job to train them, the Bible says. So, no, I want to train kids that know how to yield to the Spirit. Even from a young age, we would tell them, we, 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 we teach them this because we want them to understand what you're experiencing right now is normal. There's a part of you that wants to do right, there's a part of you that wants to do wrong, but you have to choose to be yielded to the Spirit, and you can choose that right now. We teach our kids this from a young age. Let them know, no, you're not a bad kid. You know, No, you're not a liar. You're not, even though you're tempted to do that, even though maybe you did do that, that all that is, that's, you're not a bad person. All that is is you just yielded to the flesh right there. And in any moment, you could choose opposite and yield to the Spirit. And, and we need to be aware of this. Just because you're 
you may have certain things going on in your life, maybe certain sin, certain bondages, certain addiction. Don't ever buy into the lie that that's who you are. That's not who you are if you are a son or a daughter of God. That is not who you are. In Christ, you are different. You are a new creation. But you're having a problem right now yielding. You're having a problem yielding to the Spirit. But you know what? We can change that. And we can deal with that. We can make that better. Amen? How many of you would rather have a boss work for somebody that knows how to yield to the Spirit versus yielded to the flesh? I heard an amen on that one. Yeah, it's just better being around people. I'd rather have friends that know how to yield to the Spirit. Just all around, it's better. So, but notice in this passage what we see, the Spirit and the flesh, okay, the, the Holy Spirit, and then the fleshly part of you, what we see here is that each of them have desires, or you could say it this way, the Spirit and the flesh both express themselves in your life, they make their presence known in your life. How? Through desires. They make their presence known in your life through desires. How do you know the Holy Spirit is working in your life? Because He will give you desires that you didn't have on your own. He'll give you desires that come from God. How do you know you still are dealing with a fleshly sin nature? Because of the desires that you find present from time to time. They both make themselves known, or you could say it this way, they both make their will known, their desire known in your life through, by giving you desires through desires that you have. If you ever wonder, you know, do I, still, do I still have a flesh nature? Well, just watch it for a little while, and as these certain desires pop up, you'll go, where did that come from? Why am I having that desire. Why am I having that thought to act that way, to talk that way, to think that way? Why am I having that? Am I not saved? Am I an evil person? Am I just, you know, am I one of the bad ones or what? No. You're just like everybody on this planet. You have a flesh and that flesh has desires that are contrary to the Spirit of God. It's exactly what this passage teaches us. So don't, but the devil loves to lie to believers and make them think that there's, so, there's something wrong with them because they have wrong desires. The Bible just told us. He said, you're going to have desires from the Spirit. You're going to have desires from the flesh. Your job is to manage that and learn how to yield to the Spirit. And when you yield to the Spirit, you will stop yielding to the flesh. It doesn't mean that you will stop necessarily having wrong desires. It just means that they'll not be fulfilled in your life. Look what it says. Walk by the Spirit, or you could say yield to the Spirit, verse 16, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, I want us to get into this even further. Let's go to the book of James, chapter 1, verse 13. James, chapter 1. James is writing here about desire also, or temptation. He says, let no one say when he is tempted that I'm being tempted by God. So we know from this passage and others that God does not tempt people. God doesn't tempt you to sin. Now, God tests you. He doesn't test you to sin. He doesn't tempt you with sin to see whether or not you're going to sin or not. That's the role of Satan, and that's the role of your flesh also. So he said, don't let anybody say when he's tempted, while well, being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But now he gives this tremendous revelation of how temptation and how sin works in a person's life. He says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? His own desire. He is lured and he is enticed away by his own desire, by something that is within him. Verse 15, Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Listen, there, there, there's just a tremendous amount of revelation in these three verses. First of all, notice that desire and sin are not the same thing. Notice that desire comes before sin. Just because you have a desire to sin, that is not sin. Okay? Because you have not participated in it yet. 
the desire in and of itself is not sin. It is not sinful. Actually, it's normal according to the Scripture. So he says, but here's what happens. This is just a great understanding of how the enemy works. What the enemy will do is he will identify desires that are on the inside of you and he will begin to tempt you according to those desires. That's why temptation is different for every person. It doesn't look the same. We're not tempted on the same things because we don't all have the same desires. It makes no sense to tempt a person in an area that he doesn't have a desire for it. If you don't have a desire, you know, for, say, drugs or something like that, it makes no sense for the enemy to tempt you in that area. You don't have a desire for it. Did you know that the enemy can tempt you according to good desires as well as sinful desires? It's just desire in general. It doesn't matter whether it's a good desire or bad desire. You'll find the enemy can tempt you and get you sidetracked and lure you away uh, and, and get you on the wrong path by tempting you according to desire. Let me give you an example. There are a lot of, a lot of parents. Uh, well, let's go this way. There are a lot of people that they desire to be wealthy. They desire to have, be successful, to, to make money and live comfortably. Not necessarily a bad desire, right? But what the enemy will do is he will tempt you according to that desire to go about doing that in a way that violates the Word of God. He will tempt you to pursue that and begin, maybe, maybe begins by keeping you out of church. You pursue going after that, and it keeps you, you know, you're working every Sunday, and you're not able to be in church. Or you go after it in a way by, you know, not being generous and trying to hoard and not giving according to the way that the, the Scripture talks about. So you have a desire. It's not a bad desire, but Satan tempts you according to that desire until you begin to make decisions down the wrong path, and now you're fulfilling that desire according to the temptation. So it doesn't even have to be a bad desire. But when you start to recognize this pattern and you begin to understand how the enemy works, then you can choose, wait a minute, I'm not going to yield to that desire right now. I'm going to yield to the Spirit because I see what the enemy's doing. I know how he works. And you can stop him from working in your life. One of the most important things about desire that we have to understand, and, and in talking about this, what we're really doing is we're going one step backwards uh, before sin, because we hadn't got to sin yet. Desire precedes sin. So we could stand up here all day and we could talk about sin and sin itself, but we're going one step before that. We're going to deal with desire because if we learn how to deal with desires, we'll never, it'll stop us from getting to that point of sin. So one of the most important things to understand about desire is that in order for desire to stay alive, it has to be fed. This is so important to understand about desire. Desire stays alive by being fed. And therefore, desire can be starved. Desire can be killed through starving it or through cutting it off. Desire grows and, and shrinks according to how it is being fed. And I want to give you four ways, briefly, how desire is fed. The number one way that desire is fed is through action by acting on the desire so if you have a particular desire in your life and you act on it the desire is going to grow that's just common sense so if you have a if you have a desire we'll, we'll just keep using some of these you know simple examples but if you have a desire say for you know drugs and anyone that's dealt with drugs or alcohol addiction anything like that you you'll know what I'm talking about if you have a desire for that the more you act on it, the more it grows. It doesn't shrink by you acting on it, right? The more you act on it, the more that desire grows. So the number one way that desire is fed is through action. Another way that desire grows is through our thoughts, by thinking on it. And this is why the enemy works so much in our thought life. He'll get you thinking about that that issue, that topic, that desire, and you'll, you'll think about it, you'll meditate on it when you're laying in bed at night, when you're driving down the road, he'll get you thinking on that topic. And the more that you start thinking about it, the more you start to 
desired. It's not much different when it comes to desire for just, say, natural things. If I start talking to you this morning about a big, thick, juicy steak from Ruth Chris Steakhouse, and we just started talking about it, and now you started thinking about it, you could picture it, you could smell it, you could see the seasonings and the sizzling butter and all that on the plate, you start thinking about it. Well, you may not have had a desire for it five minutes ago, but then you start going, man, I really could eat one of those big, juicy steaks right now. So desire is fed through thought. These two work together. It is also fed through speech, through talking about it, just like we were talking about the steak. Desire is fed through talking about it. So if you discuss something with other people, how many times have we all experienced this? You didn't want something, didn't need something, maybe didn't even know something existed. And you hear people starting to talk about this new thing that, you know, maybe some new gadget or new technology, and you didn't think nothing about it, didn't even know you had a desire for it. But after hearing them talk about it, you go, man, i got to have that. I want that. I'm going to get that. It just came through you hearing, you know, speech about it, talk about it. This is one reason why television is so powerful. Because they'll, in, in the things that we watch, we'll hear things talked about that we wouldn't necessarily talk about with other people or other believers, but we're hearing it talked about on TV, and without realizing it's feeding desire, and that plays into number four way that desire is fed, which is through consumption. And when I say consumption, what I mean is through listening to certain things, reading certain things, watching certain things, basically through consuming anything on that topic. This is why the Internet... Is so powerful because you can consume anything you want to consume on the internet. I'm talking about this area, you can consume article after article, research after research, story after story on any little desire that you have. You can research it, you can fo- you can read on it, you can consume and consume and consume. And what's happening? It's reading that desire. It's it's feeding. That desire, it's keeping it alive, and it's possibly even causing it to grow. So this is why, again, the way the devil works is with desire. You know, this is why some of us will have a thought, and maybe, maybe the, the form of the desire is coming in, say, curiosity. You go, well, I'm going to research that, or I'm going to look into that. What, is, what does the Internet say about this? And you start to look at, well, for long you're consuming information on that topic and you're actually feeding that wrong desire in your life. It may have started out innocent, but you're feeding it. This is why it's so crucial uh, to monitor our teenagers around the Internet because any little curiosity, any little desire that pops in their mind, they can just get on the Internet. It's not because they're some horrible person or because they have you know, just all this sin in their life. No, they have just normal curiosity and normal desire. And as they look things up and they research things and they read articles about things, what's happening? It's feeding desire. We have to be wise about how the enemy works. The enemy works and he plays off of desires in our life. Let me read it again. Verse 14. Each person, James 1, 14, each person is tempted... When he is lured, everybody say lured. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. So it uses the word lure which is a perfect word because it, you know, we understand that word most commonly from fishing. When we go fishing, we take a bait that is going to entice desire in that fish, in, in what we are after. Certain types of fish have different types of desire to eat. So we fish for certain fish with, you know, stink bait, you know, chicken liver. And then other one we got spinner bait. And other we got worms. We got different types of bait depending on the desire that's in that fish. Certain types of bait won't work with certain types of fish because they don't have any desire for it. So we lure them with based on the desire that is in them. And notice, it is that desire. There's not anything wrong with the desire in the fish. There's nothing wrong. It's normal. But it's that desire that ends up leading to their capture and ultimately their death and eating in the skillet and in the frying pan 
ultimately that's what it leads to. But it all began how? It began by desire. If they didn't have a desire for the thing that we're given, it would be much harder to capture them. It'd be much harder to bring them to that place. You need to understand that in these types of things, we're not much different than fish, and really we're not much smarter than fish when it comes to this, when we're talking about dealing with Satan, okay? Satan's been around for a long time. He's tempted a lot of people. He's lured a lot of people away from the things of God. As a matter of fact, from the very first human, he was successful tempting and luring Adam and Eve away from their, their destiny, tempting it according to their desire and pulling them away from the things of God. And from then until now, he's been repeating it over and over and over again in every person's life, identifying desires in them and luring them away by those desires. This is why what we're reading in Galatians chapter 5 is so crucial because he gives us the answer. He said, don't yield to that temptation. Don't yield to the desires of the flesh. Yield to the desires of the spirit, and you'll never gratify the desires of the flesh. The power of decisions and choices and yielding, we may say, we'll say it different ways. The power of yielding one way or the other is that it's exponential. Just because you yield to something one time may not have tremendous power or tremendous effect in your life. It's the fact that decisions and choices are exponential. The power of choices is that they are exponential. So, for example, tomorrow, if you decide to start going to the gym, you're not going to notice any tremendous results from that the next day or maybe even the next week because... The power in decisions is that they are exponential and that they build upon each other. They grow. So if you are consistent in your choice for six months, then you might see some tremendous differences and tremendous results. Well, it's the same way with sin and any choice that we make in our life, any decision. The power is exponential. The more you yield to the flesh, the more of a grip that it gets on you. The more of a hold that it gets on you. And the more effect it has, and that's why James, he just, he sums up the process real fast. I mean, this could be talked about so much, but he's just saying it in a few words. He says, each person's lured when he's enticed by his own desire, but then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and then sin when it is fully grown. See, in those words, he's explaining this whole process He's saying once sin has got you and its, its claws are in you and it continues to grow and grow and grow and grow, when it is fully grown, it brings forth death. Spiritual death and oftentimes physical death as well. So he's talking about a process. Now, if you're going to be successful at following Galatians chapter 5, yielding to the Spirit, then you're going to have to understand this process. You're going to have to understand how Satan works, what his tricks are, how his deception works, how he lures, how he entices according to desire. When you understand that, then in a moment when you're tempted to sin, you can pull back for just a moment and go, all right, what's going on right now? I'm having a desire to do this. And instead of all the cloudy confusion that typically comes in people's mind, just make it real simple and go, wait, I have a desire to do this, nothing wrong with the desire, but I'm not yielding to it. I'm yielding to the Spirit right now. Here's another thing. If you have a desire in your life that you feel like is bigger than you, that you can't control, guess what? You can starve it. Quit feeding it. Quit reading on it. Quit talking on it. Quit thinking on it. Quit researching on it. Quit feeding it. Quit watching things that stir it up. Quit participating in things that stir it up, and I promise you that desire will die. But we don't, many times we don't realize that we're actually feeding it through things that we're doing. If you have a desire that's bigger than you, that's causing you problems, you've got to starve it. Quit feeding the thing, and it will shrink. It will die. Romans chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Let not sin therefore reign. In your mortal body. That word reign just means to exercise authority, to have authority. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought forth 
from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. This is how we should live each day of our life is presenting our body. When he says your instruments, he's talking about your hands, your mouth, your ears, your eyes. Take your body and present it to God to be used for righteous things. Don't allow your members, the parts of your body, your physical body, don't allow your physical body to be used to sin. He said, do not present your members, talking about the parts of your body, do not present it to sin as an instrument for unrighteousness. What is so clear in this passage, again, is that we have complete control over it. We're in the captain's seat. He says it very simple. Do not present your body to unrighteousness. Do not present it to sin. Instead, present it to God. And let God use your hands. Let God use your mouth, your eyes, your ears, your whole body. Let God use your body for righteousness to accomplish righteous things. And I know what some of you are thinking, because this has happened so often in church, People think, well, I want to do that. I want to live godly. And matter of fact, sitting right here right now, I feel like I can do it. But I know what's going to happen. I'm going to leave this room, and I'm going to go a few days, and all those desires are going to be gone, and I'm going to be overtaken by a whole new set of desires, and I'm not going to be able to, to present my body to God the way that you're talking about right there. I've done this before where I want to live for God, but once I'm out of here, I find that I can't do it. This is an age-old problem. Everybody's going through it. Every believer goes through it. Okay? It's very common. I want to read this to you, though, so that you don't buy the lie of the enemy. Because I, I, I just want to tell you right now, Satan is not as powerful in your life as you think he is. He'd love you to think. He'd love you to think that he's got you. He's got you hooked that you just can't help it. It's a lie. It is a lie. It is a, lie. It is a deception. He is not as powerful in your life as you think he is. He is much weaker in your life than you realize. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 Listen to what it says. No temptation. Everybody say, no temptation. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. This was written thousands of years ago. It was true then. It's true now. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common, normal to man. You're not different. You're not special. It's common to everybody. Everybody's tempted. Everybody deals with this. He said, is not, no, no temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Now, hold on just a minute. I thought the common line of thinking was, I can't help this. I can't overcome this. Well, the Bible said that God will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. Your ability to what? Your ability to say no. Your ability to choose to be yielded to the Spirit instead of yielded to the flesh. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Did you know, based on this scripture, that you never have to sin again? You never have to sin again. I know there's only about 2% of you in here that believe that. But according to the scripture, you never have to sin again. Now, another truth of scripture is that we will. (laughs) But you don't have to. So you got to stop saying lies. Stop speaking lies. Stop saying, I can't help this. I can't change that. This is just who I am. This is bigger than me. Stop saying all of those things. Why don't you start saying this? Because I'm going to tell you, if you already believe that going in, if you already believe I'm defeated, Satan's bigger than me, he's got me beat, I can't help this, that's exactly what you're going to get. You're going to be defeated from the start and from the get. But if you meditate on this, and in that moment you go, well, wait a minute. I'm being tempted to do this. I'm struggling with this. But wait a minute. I read in 1 Corinthians 10 where the Bible said that God would not allow me to be tempted beyond my ability. 
and that in every opportunity that I'm being tempted, the Bible said he would provide a way of escape. So where is that way of escape right now? Where is that way of escape that I can take, that I can pursue right now so that I can yield to the Spirit instead of that? And if the Bible is true, then God will help you in that moment. And through His power and your ability, you can overcome sin. And you can yield to the Spirit and not yield to the flesh. Amen? Amen. So don't. it starts with, you can't buy the lies of the enemy. You can't buy the lies of the devil that you start thinking, well, I just can't, I can't do this. You're saying opposite of what Scripture says. And, and part of the, the healing process is you've got, to start, you've got to stop speaking lies. Because the more you speak them, the more you believe them, and the more power they'll have in your life. You've got to, you've got to combat that with the Word of God, and you've got to say, no, thank God that I have the ability to overcome this right now. Thank God that there's a way of escape being provided to me right now to do the right thing and make the right choice. And I'm going to choose to yield to the Spirit right now. That's exactly what Jesus did. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus was tempted. And you think, well, he was Jesus. Yeah, but the Bible says he emptied himself. He emptied himself when he came. He didn't live this life as the Son of God only. He lived this life as a man. And he did it without sinning. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now stop right there. The desire that Jesus had for food was at a wrong desire course not. He'd been fasting for 40 days. Uh, the idea that he was hungry and wanted something to eat, no problem there. But it was a desire in him. And how did Satan tempt him? What was the first thing he did? He came and he said, well, if you are the son of God, why don't you turn those stones into bread? In other words, why don't you use your miraculous power to do something selfish for your own self? Why don't you use the power of God to just, you know, just to work for your own self? But what he was doing, he was tempting him according to his desire for food. Not a wrong desire. But that was his, that's his pattern. That's what we've been talking about this morning. He will identify desires and weaknesses in you, and he'll tempt you according to those. Each point Satan tempted a desire in Jesus. If you read this whole passage, Matthew chapter 4, every, he, there's three temptations. Every temptation was a desire that was in Jesus, and none of them were wrong desires. One of the temptations he says I'll give you if you'll bow down to me I'll give you the whole whole world well it's in Jesus to be ruler of the whole world that's his destiny but what Satan was trying to do was make him take a shortcut to get there and he was tempting him according to his desire to be at that place of rulership over the earth so each point Satan tempted him according to his desire and it's the same way with you now I want to read this, uh, this passage, 1 Samuel chapter 13, this is a story about King Saul. And I want to read this to you because it illustrates this example uh, perfectly. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 6. Now, what's going on in 1 Samuel is that the, the Israelites are fighting the Philistines. And the prophet Samuel told Saul that he was going to meet him at a specific point on a specific day and that they were going to offer sacrifices before he went into battle. And in the Old Covenant, the king was not authorized to offer sacrifices. It had to be done by the priest or the prophet. And so King Saul had no authority to, to offer the sacrifice. So he's waiting on Samuel, but Samuel hasn't shown up yet. And the, the army's falling apart. People are deserting. There's all kind of problems, and he's ready to go into battle, but he doesn't want to go into battle without God's favor. So he says, we're just going to offer this sacrifice because we've got to have the favor of God. I don't know where Samuel's at. I'm not waiting on him. I'm moving forward. So 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 6, it says, The men of Israel saw that they were in trouble because the troops were in a difficult situation. They hid in caves, thickets, among rocks, and in holes, and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul, however, was still at Gilgal, and all his troops were gripped with fear. 
He waited seven days for the appointed time that Samuel had set, but Samuel didn't come to Gilgal, and the troops were deserting him. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offering. Then he offered the burnt offering. Just as he finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. So Saul went out to greet him, and Samuel asked, what have you done? Saul answered, well, when I saw that the troops were deserting me, and you didn't come within the appointed days, and the Philistines were gathering at Michmash, I thought the Philistines will now descend on me at Gilgal, and I haven't sought the Lord's favor, so I forced myself to offer this burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, you have been foolish. You have not kept the command which the Lord your God gave you. It was at this time that the Lord would have permanently established your reign over Israel. But now your reign will not endure. The Lord has found a man loyal to him, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not done what the Lord commanded. Now I want you to notice this. First of all, I want you to notice a few things. First of all, this was a habit in Saul's life. And that's the thing about habits, is you don't ever know when the, the consequences of those habits are going to come full circle. You may go on a particular way doing something for years, knowing that it's wrong, knowing that it's sin, and there's not any real consequences to it. But you don't know the moment or the day when those consequences are going to come full circle. And this is not God punishing you, okay? This is not God punishing you, saying because of your sin, these consequences are coming. No, this is just the nature of sin. All right? When you have a habit and a pattern of violating your conscience, you have a habit and a pattern of yielding to the flesh instead of yielding to the Spirit, there will be that moment where it will come full circle, and it can cost you, and it can cost you everything. We've all seen this dozens of times, marriages destroyed, families destroyed, businesses destroyed, because there were patterns and habits that maybe were being done in secret, but there was that moment where it came full circle and the consequences hit. And they thought, man, I had all this time to change, had all this time to do, but I just kept going the same path. That's exactly what happened to Saul. Notice, notice what he said here. This is so important. He said that it was at this time that the Lord would have permanently established your reign over Israel. But now your reign will not endure. Everything was taken from Saul. In other words, he completely missed the will of God. It was God's will for him to be king. Over if, if Saul had done this correctly, we may not have even ever heard of King David. You may have never heard of King David killing Goliath. You may have never heard of any of that because... Apparently, it was the will of God that Saul would have been that man. He said, I would have established your throne forever. But it was because of this decision. Now, this, again, this is not just, oh, one mistake that Saul made, and you think, oh, man, God took everything from him. That's not what's happening here. This was a habit and a pattern in Saul's life. If you keep reading about Saul's life, you'll find out that, uh, that uh, even after this, that there was a time that that God told Saul, to, he gave him specific commands about how to deal with an army, and he didn't follow God's instructions at all. He just did what he wanted to do because of fear of the people. You'll find another time where Saul was trying to hear from God, and he got tired of waiting because he couldn't hear from God, so he went and found a witch that could summon the dead for him. So he, he just, he, you know, you, you'll find uh, that he was constantly yielding to these types of things. You'll find where uh, he should have been happy for David rising up through the ranks. But instead, he, yield, he yielded to jealousy and was jealous of David and tried to kill him, tried to murder him. So this was a habit in Saul's life. And it's real simple. You go, well, what was wrong with Saul? Same thing that's wrong with a lot of us. He had a habit of yielding to the flesh. That's all it was. In that moment, he was getting impatient. He was tired of waiting on Samuel. And at that moment, he could have yielded to patience. He could have yielded to the Spirit. He could have said, no, I'm going to wait. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to wait and trust God. He could have done that, but he yielded to the flesh. So that's the second thing that I want you to notice about this story is that whether you yield to the Spirit or whether you yield to the flesh, it matters, okay? It's not going to be the same. It's not going to turn out the same if, oh, if I yield to the Spirit or if I yield to the flesh. No, 
the consequences can be drastically different depending on if you chose to yield to the Spirit or you chose to yield to the flesh. So don't just think of it like, oh, well, it'll be okay. It'll turn out, everything will turn out. God will forgive me and everything will be okay. Look, sometimes, especially when we've built patterns and habits of doing a particular thing, sometimes it matters more than you can possibly imagine. Sometimes your whole destiny is affected by it. Sometimes the whole destiny of our kids are affected by it. So it matters what you yield to, and it matters whether or not we learn to yield to the Spirit as we've been talking about this morning. Not once, not twice, as a lifestyle. A lifestyle of yielding to the Spirit versus yielding to the flesh. I'm talking about daily, daily choices, daily decisions, thinking this way. I'm going to yield to the Spirit right now. And until we do that, until we get that, there's no sense in us even moving on and talking about the fruit of the Spirit because you'll never have the fruit of the Spirit unless you learn to yield to the Spirit. Well, we can go, in, we can go on down Galatians 5 in this series and we can start talking about the fruits of joy, love, peace, kindness, all of them. We can start talking about the fruit of the Spirit. You'll never walk in those. You'll never see those in your character. You'll never see those in your marriage. You'll never see those in your life unless you learn what we're talking about this morning which is how to yield to the Spirit. The only way those fruits get produced and come out is through yielding to the Spirit. In a moment of frustration, yielding to kindness. In a moment of uh, sexual temptation, yielding to self-control. So the, everything we're talking about this morning has to do with the fruit of the Spirit, but we had to build a foundation of, okay, this is how we're going to get those fruits in our life because they're not magical. They come by yielding to the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's stand on our feet this morning. Let's bow our heads together.